say that one. Okay, where did the third one go? Why are you not showing me the third one? What time? Oh, we got three minutes. I can get it done. If not, come on, load, 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 hurry, load for me. Okay, there's the third beneficials was the third one. For some reason that wasn't showing up. I had to like literally open the email to get it. So I'm gonna open that. One more download. And we'll be good to go. Mm -hmm. All right, save that. Okay. All right, they're popping in two minutes. Okay, trying to get something here to go. Hmm. Oh, it's it right there. There they are. What's bugging you? Document. Okay. All right, got them all downloaded, got the email ready to get out there. Let's close this. You are all right, your screen's up and ready. All right, we've got eight people waiting. And it looks like the same ones. Hmm. All right, they're coming in. All right, I'm gonna, we've got one minute to go. I'm just gonna go ahead and admit them all. Let me set it to go here. Admit all. All right, I think everyone is joined us. Hello, everyone. Can can everybody hear me? Janet, can you hear me pretty good? Yes, ma'am. All right, awesome. All right, everyone. Well, it's one o'clock straight up. And unlike last week when we had a beautiful sunny day, we got a rainy day here in Dallas again. But that's all right, because I'm thinking in the summer we'll be going worse the rain. So we're just going to take it right now and roll with it. All right, well, today is the third of the four part series of insects that are in your garden. And Janet Hurley is going to get us some more great information. She has also sent me uh, three documents that I will email to you. So you've got those uh, for, rep for future reference. I'm trying to think of anything else. I can't think of anything. Um, if you have any questions, Janet, do you want them to go ahead and, and as you go or wait till the end? Um, they can go ahead and drop questions in the chat. And if it's something, you know, relevant, just, you know, I'll make sure watch. I know. Okay. I'll watch for the chat there. So, all right. Well, with that being said, Janet, I'm going to hand it over to you. All righty. And just so everybody knows, I am going to record this one and we'll try and get this one posted because as I explained to, to Ms. Rudd that this is going to be a lot of information. I'm hoping we'll get through it all. So welcome to Unwanted Guests, Insects in the Garden. And we're gonna be discussing 
some of the most common things you're going to be seeing around your yard or on walks or wherever you go outdoors because we all know about the good bees which are pollinators the cool butterflies butterflies and moths i mean those are definitely insects that you'll see you know most commonly outdoors and then of course the other ones that you may not be aware of are what we call predators are spiders are lady beetles in a variety of different um, formats and even predatory wasps so understanding that we have several different species that you know most people just don't realize even these are good guys they're not bad guys and finally you know there's lots of folks that see anything that drops this away and or a wolf spider We'll call them scary, but they are actually very, very good because they do eat a lot of our outdoor insects that do feed on your plants. Finally, one of the other ones that are really quite interesting is these parasitic wasps. Parasitic wasps, and they come in a variety of uh, species and varieties. And what's interesting about these is that when um, they fly and they go and mate and then go to lay eggs, they typically lay their eggs on something that is not good. This is scale and we'll talk about scale in a little while. But what they do is they inject using in some part of their their body and usually it is a stinger that are ovipositor and actually deposits their eggs in these and then what you'll see and this is a different species <clears throat> that does this but what happens is when they overposit generally the eggs once they hatch you know this is the food and then they hatch and re-emerge there are ants that will also do that on other insect species. There are wasps that will actually attack ants. So parasites and parasitoids, it's a, a symbiotic way that pests, and they're really not, we wouldn't call them pests, the biodiversity of, of insects in nature is what kind of balances things out. It's not always good, especially because as we get further with more development, um, more uh, chemical use, non-chemical use, different types of, of plants changing our ecological and our biodiversity, sometimes these do, do fall prey. So a lot of folks think that, you know, one of the things that is great is, oh, <clears throat> if I use these beneficials, that'll take care of my problem because I want to be green and I want to be organic. Truth be told, there's not enough praying mantis. There's not enough ladybugs, lady beetles. There's not enough parasitic type of insects to control what we have. And so when you're out in the garden and you start seeing things, and this one is cool, and someday if I ever see one of these, it's it will make, make my day, but understand this, with our insect pests and with that biological cycle, they come from an egg, to generally a caterpillar form to something like this if I'm a moth. Generally, when we're talking about chewing pests, all of these species, except for the beetles, the caterpillars, the grasshoppers, the snails and the slugs, generally their life stages don't change so dramatically that you cannot distinguish what they are. So again, a caterpillar, yes, does come as an egg, but as they grow and before they become a moth, what ends up happening is you can see them. You will see them physically on the plant. 
um, grasshoppers, uh, crickets, the, those that insect species, when they hatch, yes, they come out little, but as they grow, but the whole time they chew, snails and slugs, they, they, they suck the life out of your plants. That's just about the way I can determine it because when they are around, they literally do suck a lot of moisture. This is probably something you are seeing right now. I would not be surprised if with all of this moisture you're seeing, especially in the pots, things like that. I mean, it's, they're, they're hanging out around moisture and they're looking for food. You can literally just get rid of them and we'll talk about that in a little bit about how to actually remove them. I threw this one in mostly because I realized we probably may start seeing not only these, I mean, there have been a variety of caterpillars from the Gulf Coast of Texas all the way up here to North Texas. And again, the fall webworm, which don't let the name fool you, can start as early as June and you'll start seeing the moths. And then what you'll see is generally this, you'll start seeing this spinning and you may see these worms. It's you know gonna be unsightly if you see it. Generally, I tell everybody, if you can use your gardening pruner and reach up and rip open this actual, um, tent area that is just as effective as if you were doing some type of caterpillar control so it doesn't really matter what type of caterpillar it is if it's a caterpillar on your um plants if it's a caterpillar in a tree most of the products that are out there start with again one is low toxicity bacillus thuringigenis and before you guys ask a ton of questions about chemical controls, remember that's gonna be the, what we're gonna cover next week is really what's in these types of chemicals. But I thought it was extremely important for y'all to have some information so you know what to do going forward. So lo low toxicity BT. Next on the list is generally soaps and oils. So they make insecticidal soaps, they make a horticultural oil, Either way, generally what they're made of is how it works on these insect pests is when you spray them, when you hit the insect, it gets on them and it helps suffocate them. Then spinosad or spinosad, depending on tomato, tomato, this is probably one of the most um, popular products, especially if you're doing gardening and you're doing vegetable gardening. And the reason, and it's this active ingredient, because spinosad is a, a micro-based insecticide, it breaks down fairly quickly in the environment and it's really not toxic to a lot. And because it carries this Omri name, it really means that it's a little bit kinder to the environment so these would be your three, you know, low toxics that you would try to do on caterpillars first. Whereas when we get into the pyrethroids, <clears throat> it's a little bit more. So what do I mean? Well, the pyrethroids, which is the alternative to <clears throat> Durazban and Diazinam, which were pop <clears throat> popular chemicals a couple decades ago, the pyrethroids are a synthetic class that is designed to be long lasting in the environment. In other words, it's called residual. Most when you look at active ingredients end in THRN, and then there's one guy who dares to be different. The other class of chemistry that works on caterpillars is this neonicotinoid pesticides. And these are their active ingredients and you might be familiar with this, and this is what we will cover next week, is when you hear this class of chemistry, it is often associated now with being very cautious around bees, pollinators particularly. 
both of these <clears throat> do. So that's why we're covering it next week. But again, depending on where we're at and we're having an outbreak of tech caterpillars, fall armyworms, something like that, then yes, you may not need to do this every year. Hopefully not. Um, and it may only be seasonal, hopefully every few years, but these are all options. The other one that definitely perplexes most North Texas gardeners is white grubs. So white grubs are the immature version of that big, ugly June beetle. Well, the big, ugly June beetle is flying right now. You see them, they're, they're coming around. And when they mate and lay their eggs, they lay it in the turf. And then as the eggs emerge and get older, this is what you end up with is this white grub. And it has these chewing parts, mouth parts. What it does is they actually chew the root system below. And it's very interesting when you're talking to the, the turf specialist, our hardest part is diagnosing when you say, oh, I've got a brown spot in my yard. And especially right now, it's a very hard um, answer to solve because especially um, right now, because again, we had a, a frost in, in February, we've had, we had a really nice warm up and then we've had these rains. So, but what you will see between now and July is the white grubs will mature. And between now and July, if you do have grubs, the time to take care of it is generally around the 4th of July. So simple text to, to actually, and, and I can, we can send this out to y'all later, is if you really wanna know if you've got insects in your turf, you take two cups dish soap liquid to one gallon of water and in a square foot block in your lawn, you pour it. Once you pour it, give it 10, 15 minutes, whatever's in the soil is gonna boil up because remember all insects have that fragile ectoskeleton. So the grubs, the chinch bugs, um, worms, everything will boil up. But if you've got a lot of little grubs by 4th of July, then here's some of your options. Beneficial nematodes. Now, the reason we say this is for the dedicated organic gardener is soil temperature's gotta be right. Moisture in the soil's gotta be right. These have got to be fresh. So it's know thy vendor and then know what I'm doing when I do it. The granular insecticides, and there's a whole host of different ones now. Matter of fact, the ones that we used to recommend have all changed because Bayer has changed their consumer brand to this bio advanced and they've changed the active ingredients in here. But you've got either the Emulatocloprid, which is again, that neonicotinoid, both of these are. And then this halovenazide is actually um, a growth regulator. So it actually stops the grub from growing into maturity. Grasshoppers, and the reason again, I put these in is depending on where you live. And even though we say rural and urban fringe pests, wind, rain, everything else contributes to these, yes, if they're chewing on your, your plants, if there's something you don't want them to chew on, we always recommend row covers. And this goes for you know, your vegetable garden or even if you're trying to grow certain ornamentals, sometimes your best bet is a row cover. Chemicals that work on them, pyrethroids. Do you have a question for me, my dear? Yes, on nematodes. I want to. I didn't want you to go any further because Donna's asking, uh, do you have to store beneficial nematodes in the refrigerator until use? It all depends on who you buy them from and where they're coming from. I know for research purposes, they generally are shipped in it. I mean, the immediate thing is placed in the refrigerator. So it that, that's part of the dedication. That's part of your dedication to the nematodes. 
I tried it and honestly, I pulled my hair out and I had much, I had long hair, beautiful hair, like, like Liz back in the day, but I, you know, I've learned that there's some other things, but nematodes, I, I joke and say, you got to hold your mouth just right and pray. Now, as promised, because I, it, if you're not seeing one of these, I mean, I just took that image this past weekend and the, these folks are, are there all the time is, I mean, it's snails and slugs. Part of it is sanitation, part of it is trapping. You can use barriers, I mean, to, to try and keep them out of your garden. But basically there are some different baits. Um, some of the baits that, that have the active ingredient is, and I'm gonna butcher the name, mahaldehyde, and then iron phosphate, um, salt, can can be used um they don't like copper if you didn't know that i mean it's one of the biggest things that most folks don't understand is these guys don't like they don't like dry i mean the reason you're seeing them and i'm seeing them everywhere crawling up walls on sides of buildings and stuff is the moisture so generally what i will do because I love my um, mockingbirds and a couple of other songbirds. A lot of times if I can find them, I'll toss them out or put them on a dish. I have seen others eat them. So the next category of insects we're gonna discuss is the ones that really do the most damage in our gardens. And these are the ones that drive us crazy because you start seeing them now and you can see them all the way to fall. And these are our phloem feeders. And remember phloem is the, that part of the plant that you know sends all the nutrients everywhere. But all of these insects, the aphids, the white fly, the scale, the mealybugs, the thrips, they all feed on something on that plant that makes it look nasty. And when I mean nasty, I mean, I am talking about black city mole and a honeydew. And here's your aphids. Here's some immatures. You've got shed skins. But because it's aphids and no matter what life cycle they are in, they are sucking up, sucking out that life out of that plant. So understanding that, I mean, this is a, a common sign common that you have a flow and feeder. So the most common, like I said, are aphids. Aphids are very, very minute. They have these two cornicles on their rear end that that's where the um, honeydew comes from. So as they're sucking things out of the plant, you know, they've got to excrete. That is part of their excretion. You can see very magnified what their um, mouth parts look like. And generally when you see them on a plant, I don't care where I see them, you always see them stacked up because that's how they live. They, they love each other so well. But generally, you know, for natural controls, you can use hard water streams. And what I mean is using jet or using the flat on a on a sprayer and you can bounce them off. I mean, that's one way. The other again is using those um, horticultural oils and insecticidal soaps. And then when we talk about systemics, what we're talking about is either you use those residual insecticides that when you spray it, you gotta hit it to get it. So the products like Malathion or Carbaryl or like I said, that Cyfluthrin, that bio-advanced garden, the spectricides. If the product has got thrin in it, that's the most common that you'll find, oh, all plant killer. You've got to spray the plant and then hopefully drench those aphids to kill them. Systemic means I drench the soil and it goes down and then the roots take it up 
And then when the insect is feeding on this, chewing or sucking, then they take in the, the insecticide as well. And that's what actually gets them. So a few things that you should be familiar with is if you're out there and you're in your garden and you're looking at your aphids and you see some common miscreants, <clears throat> a couple of things. One, parasitic wash. Yes, they will burrow into the aphids. Two, this is the larvae of the lace ring. Doesn't look anything like them. And then this is the larvae of a lady beetle. So yes, in all stages, a lot of these are feeding on, on the aphids for, for nutrients. The other pest that I threw in, because I'm going to bet you're going to see this one too, because scale, again, depending on the type of scale, either loves moisture or hates it loves heat or hates it. <clears throat> the armored scale, which is really hard to kill because it has a hard back, is generally one that will, will like warmth, whereas the soft scale, and this is evidence of the euonymus scale, that likes a lot of moisture and that's where that honeydew comes in because it just keeps excreting out of the, the plant and they just keep doing more damage and the plant can't keep up. So it just it keeps excreting. Generally, when we're talking about scale, we generally talk about pruning, using those soaps, dormant and summit oils, the systemics, and then trying to kill crawlers, which isn't easy to see because you need a microscope. The scale I really want to focus on, though, for, for this talk is something that probably is focusing on in your yards. And this has to do with crepe myrtle bark scale. You know, crepe myrtles have been around for ages. I mean, I have several that are, are this size. But if you've driven around town, if you've seen them, you'll start seeing this black. And even though the bark comes off, the black just keeps coming. And what you start noticing is that the flowers are not as full. The, the tree struggles just a little bit more. And again, because it is a scale and because it can suck the life out of it, that's what it's doing. So when you see this, and you see this little white stuff and it starts like this and i'll be real honest i mean i have a and i have very i have several mature crepe myrtles i have a volunteer that came up and i'm was letting it go the, because it's younger yes it started two years ago and now my with it looking white like it is now it, the the branches are black it doesn't bloom as better as, as much as anything. But the two invasive insects that came and they're in North Texas, they're not everywhere, they're, they're here, is this crepe myrtle aphid and this crepe myrtle bark scale. And they're both native to Asia. We're really not sure how they got here. It was maybe 10 years ago now, that um, Neil Sperry contacted Dr. Mike Merchant, who retired last year, who was our ur urban and landscape entomologist, about seeing this on the great myrtles up in McKinney. And lo and behold, we realized we had a new species in our state, and it is expanding, but it started here, and it, it started a, a whole research trend because you've got these aphids that will feed on um, the, the plant as well, one lends itself to the other. So re 
understanding that if you're seeing this on your plants, especially your, your crepe myrtles, this does indicate, this is generally more damage than, than we like to see. I've not seen my leaves get this bad, but again, my trees haven't gotten that bad and I'm gonna have to watch them. It's up to you or what do you wanna do? So if you've got honeydew and it's really nasty on the leaves, then you can use those systemic insecticides like that imidacloprid and the uh, thiamoxifen, which is that bio-advanced stuff from Bayer. If there's no honeydew, so you're looking at scale like on um, oh, yucca or something like that, you can use the oils or there's some sprays and they're actually called crawler sprays. And to help you all out, because we do have how to treat for your crepe myrtle bark scale. This is something that Liz can share with you guys. And I'm pretty sure if you were sitting right at your computer and you were really on it, I'm gonna talk for one more minute. So you can click on that link and you can go there if you would like to. Because the next pest I'm gonna share with you is the pest of evil. And the reason I refer to thrips as being evil is they are so minute. The only drawing or any image I can show you all is something of a schematic drawing because they are so, so small. Generally what happens is you see this damage and really where we see it, <clears throat> that especially with our roses, is here. I mean, I've seen it with um, chrysanthemums. I've seen it with other um, flowering plants, but all of them, what thrips do is feed inside these buds. They damage the growth. They darken, they stunt it. And things that you can try to use, and I'm going to be very honest, it's this you it, it thrips are kind of like mites you they're never ending and you you do have to work at it but the spinosad if you're wanting something that is uh low toxicity the systemics like the acephate the orthene it's drenched in insecticidal soaps you've got to cover everything and then again the horticultural oils like neem before i go FYI, it, I didn't put it in here because we're not talking disease, but the thrips are what transmits that rose rosette disease that affects most of our knockout roses and a lot of our hybrid roses as well. I mean, it's thrips that carry the, um, the virus as they go from feeding to feeding from one plant to another. And that's how the plants, not only do they get the damage from the thrips, but the thrips also transmit the virus, therefore making the whole entire plant icky. Because that's the only word, nice word I can say for rose rosette. I have other words, but we're on, we're recording. Now, those that feed on leaves, this is a personal image from literally my backyard. And there are little insects right now. And the two big ones that I've, I've, I've seen so far are the mites. And it's not spider mites right yet. It, there's another version of mites. I have not seen the lice bugs yet, but that doesn't mean I just didn't notice them. But the one I am seeing, and I'm going to talk about this one, is the four-line stripe bug, because this one is popping out. But what leaf cell feeders do is, again, they feed on that leaf, and what you'll end up seeing is that stippling. So they, they suck all of the life out of the leaf. So it goes from green to like white transparent. This is 
Mr. Four Line Stripe Buck. There, <clears throat> there's a couple of different ones. If you were to go out and really look at it, several of them, they have lines this way. They also have lines this way. There's one that's got a red, but they all do the same thing because again, sucking moth parts come up in here and, and suck the life out of the leaf. So one of the things that you can do, especially for this type of pest is, and, and because they're so prevalent around here, I, I wanted to make sure y'all understood this one. You're gonna have to look for the danger and anywhere from late May to early June, mine started actually early May, but our weather's been so wacky. The sooner they are detected, the sooner they can be managed. Again, so it's a matter of, do I want to do something? Is it a plant that I really am worried about? Or do I make the decision? Do I let it just ride, you know? Because it would be three for the insect and one to grow. Again, if there's, if there's moderate number, do nothing, do no harm. I, I generally don't do anything. I may, I actually have um, on that particular mist flower plant, I'm deciding if I'm going to just remove it and see how that goes, but I'm afraid they'll move to something else. So I'm deciding, do I just sacrifice the one for the all? Because that's really what you can do. In the fall, again, clean up everything. And then if you're really, you know, conscientious and you need to do something, chemical controls. Using, again, that's insecticidal soap. Again, the pyrethrins, which is the natural version of the pyrethroids. And then that long-term residual control that those pyrethroids, the bifenthrin, the cyfluthrin. Again, it, it, this is where as a, as a gardener, you start making your decisions. Where, you know, what battle am I fixed fighting in my yard? If I don't care, I don't care. The other one, and this one will come generally later in the summer, you'll start seeing these guys. I've seen them show up in August, September, October, and they're spider mites. Because once it gets hot and dry, and they're, they're, they like the warmth, they reproduce fast and you sometimes don't notice it, but if, especially if you've got plants like in a seeding area or something like that, you may notice this webbing. And I have to tell you guys, I have tried to take this picture myself and it really upset me that I had to use a Creative Commons because I have tried to capture this and I cannot get it as well as this to show you the webbing and the white because this is very common and it doesn't matter the plant. I have seen it on everything from a, a, a penta or a, a verbena or um, my crown of thorns, anything. So you can worsen them generally by you know using an insecticide generally what i do is i just take a cloth and i'll go up the stems and wipe all that off and toss everything away so disposable is better but whatever you can do because that's physically removing them and taking away eggs and everything else and now you've really eliminated it <clears throat> again you can use water streams soaps and oils pyrethrins sulfur, and then, like I said, the, the bifenthrin. So <clears throat> depending on uh, where you've gotten out lately, it's depending on if you encountered our favorite ant of Texas, because Nothing says happiness like meeting a red and ported fire ant when you're out and about. They have been around. They were introduced in the late 1930s. 
in um, a port in Alabama from South America. They entered Texas in about 1950s. And a lot of folks say, well, why, why can't we eradicate them? And it's simply because they have no natural predator. In South America, they do. In North America, they don't. And while we can do a lot for them, simply trying to control them. And, and I tell everybody, if you think about what kind of chemistry we've had since the late 1930s, heavy industrial organophosphates, I mean, organochlorines, and that did nothing on these ants. It gives you an idea of how resilient an insect population really can be. And fire ants by and large are probably one of the most resilient insects on this planet. Now, everyone thinks that these mounds pop up just overnight. They do not. Yes, we have seen them and they are increasing, but after each rain, yes, they push up more dirt in order to dry themselves out. But in truth, when you are looking at a mound like this, I want you to imagine something below it that is three times that size. Because when you're looking at the fire ant mound, you see this dome up here, but below that dome, and that only comes up when this is completely saturated, they prefer to go down. So generally, and, and the way we think of it is, here is their home and their castle. This is where they like to live, generally around six inches below the soil level. If it gets too hot and or too cold, they can go down and keep tunneling to cool or warm themselves up. They only come up, they only push up in the soil when they have too much moisture. Because the truth be told, this is run by a queen and a few in her court. So there are the main queen and then their lower queens. And then there are workers and then there are foragers that all come in here and tend a brood. If it gets too damp, they take her up, dry her out, make sure everybody's okay. If it gets too dry and too hot, they take them down. So again, that they can sustain them. They are very, very good at survival. To that method, almost 30 years ago, my coworker who retired, Dr. Mike Merchant, one of the things he was tasked for in the very beginning was how do we solve this persnickety pest problem? And we call the Persicone pest problem the Texas two-step method. Because in truth, if you are going to manage fire ants in your yard or in your neighborhood or any other area, if you do not do it from one edge of the property to the other edge of the property and get everybody else, fire ants are going to flourish because they are very opportunistic. So when we talk about the two-step method, the first one is let them eat bait. So the products that you will find out on the market, Andro, Andro has been around for a while. It still comes in containers like this. You can find it in bags like this. And the other one that is out there on the market is called Extinguish Plus. But what these products do is you broadcast them over the entire yard either using a hand spreader like this, or generally we use something like this, which is a herd spreader on the back of a gator, a lawnmower or something like that. Yes, you can use your fertilizer spreader, but sometimes that doesn't get it out at a very low rate because the, the success with baiting is you don't put out a clump because ants don't feed like that. 
ants are looking for little bitty pieces of morsels that actually they can pick up, take back, share it with the rest of the folks in that mound, and then they pass that along. So what we tell folks is, is when you're doing this, you want to make sure that you're broadcast from one area to the other. The other thing that people often wonder is, well, those products you mentioned, Ms. Hurley, do they, are they toxic to animals? Only in large doses. I mean, if you leave the bag out and an animal gets in it, yes, but that's against the label. If you put it out as directed from the, the, the label on the packaging and put it in the right spreader, you should have no problem. One of the things that we worry about is when do you actually do it? So yes, we see all these ant mounds out right now. And our biggest problem is trying to get the bait out when rain is not ex expected. The hardest part with baits is, is that product on, on the label will tell you, do not water in, do not put out when it's expected to rain. Because if it does say that you need to put out and you need to water it in, or you know, it it's best if you know it doesn't have a problem if it rains, then that is not an insecticidal bait. That is a residual. Remember, that's one of those contact ones. It goes in, it will either bind with the soil or will hit the ants, and that's when it kills them. The other thing is making sure of soil temperature. So making sure our soil temperature is above 70 degrees, but again, it doesn't get above 90. So May, that's not a hard thing. September, because generally when we talk about the two-step method, we talk about baiting early in the spring, now Mother's Day, and then in the fall, Labor Day, somewhere around there, so that you're covered going through all of your outdoor activities. So generally, when we're talking about when we do baiting, you can get through with doing baiting during, you know, sun up to sundown. Generally in September, we tell folks that generally they've got to do it in the evenings because the ants are smart enough that they will not come out during the day as well and they will do their feedings at night. So understand more of your insect pests know temperature fluctuations, weather patterns, and they use that to sustain themselves and to avoid being taken out by man. So the other question we always get asked about is what can I do? I wanna grow tomatoes, I wanna to grow basil, I wanna grow something in my gar garden but I don't want fire ants. This is where it gets very limited. Your options are extremely limited. The only two products with the active ingredient is either methoprene or that spinosad. These are the only ones allowed for um, use around food products that you could actually broadcast here. The other products that Amdro, it would need to be broadcast out here but you know ants don't know boundaries so i just tell everybody please be cautious of that because again whatever you use and you're going to eat you know you are what you eat the step two well again i was talking about we're seeing mounds so now what do you do i don't have time to go out and do broadcasting or it's going to keep raining and we're going to have folks over for graduation what do we do? Well, there are mound treatments. There are options. One or two ways. One is either you're going to sprinkle something on and leave it, or you're going to sprinkle something on and water it in. Either way that you do this, the product will have specific instructions. In other words, it may say, for a mound, put out a, a half a cup. If you're not sure what a half a cup is, go down to your local dollar store and purchase a, a mixing cup uh, 
set, use that in your garden and know what the difference is because more does not always mean better. Think about your environment. So you wanna make sure that when you're doing that, and then if it says mix in with a gallon of water, use a gallon of water. If it's a dust, be very careful with dust because again, you don't know what pets or children or other non-targets are around. Aerosols, aerosols are pretty quick. And what I mean by quick is you can inject um, different things into the ground that literally will go down into the ground, inject the insecticide and knock out at least that mound. And then when we talk about organic formulations, again, that spinosad or others that you can mix, I will say this, we've had enough research. No, molasses does not work. Grits do not work. Um, I can't think of some of the other remedies, but pretty much your home remedies really do not work. And only when you, FYI, because I too am a seven-year-old boy in a grown woman's body, but I too like to kick the mound every now and then. But when you kick the mound, all you do is upset the, the colony and they just pick up and move. Because remember, they're, they're, they're working underground and they're working with others. And that is their job. Their job is to stay alive. Our job is to just try to avoid them. I realize that is a lot of information. I wanted to put more in, but I realized that there was just so much that we could cover here that I, I decided I would just cover what we thought was necessary. We can do this again in the fall and talk about other pests in the fall. But some of the, again, the best resources, and before I forget, so I want to make sure, is that Insects of Texas book. Oh, let me do something for y'all. And Janet, there's two or three questions in the chat also. Okay. So let me show you this book, it's called Common Insects of Texas. Yes, you can buy it on the um, Amazon, a um, couple of other websites that I, I remember going to. The reason I'm pointing this out is if you're anyone like me, you may have a birding book, you might have a tree book, but, and they're garden books that you see sometimes in the stores. They're nice, but what I like about this one is it's just like, a bird book. It's got, you know, the insect name and then you get the pictures. And that's, I really wanted to show that to y'all because, you know, every one of us in our department got these in February. And I have to tell you, it, it's, it's a nice resource guide because sometimes you need to look something up and you know kind of what it looks like, but you're not really sure. And it's sure nice just to be go, oh, hey, this is what I've got in my garden. So, so there we go. So what kind of questions do we have? Okay, do you want me to read them to you or you might look at them and then reply? Um, I put a couple of links that you had on your slides on there. So Anne is asking if you would mind sharing the PDF because she says this talk is incredibly, all caps, helpful and choke full of information. Yeah, she, that was her disclaimer at the beginning. She had a lot and it is, and it's, it's great. So and yes, I, 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 I forgot to, to PDF with this one, but I will. Okay. And I've got the other, I've got the email ready to go to y'all with the other three. So Janet, I'll hold off for that, that PDF of your slides so I can send it all together. And then um, Crystal says, LOL, I used to put out the powder mound treatment, yet had to stop in the pasture when I caught one of the horses following me and eating it off each mound. Yeah. And then orange oil. Joyce is asking about orange oil. Orange oil is, again, it's a, um, it's, it's, it's in the class of insecticidal oils. <clears throat> it can be, so the, the only disclaimer I will say on the oils, 
is this. Depending on when you put it out and what's going on in, in our climate, they can suffocate your plant as well. So be real, real careful on that. I mean, it can do that. It can, you know, burn as well. So be real careful when you do it. And then right. for Donna, who was asking yeah. about sulfur, again, sulfur is good as long as it's dry. Things like sulfur, diatomaceous earth, boric acid, any of those that are powdery, generally, even on the label, it says once, get, once it gets wet, it, it dilutes itself. It's one of those things. Now, I will tell you this, if you are a hiker, and you do not like chiggers, my rule of thumb back in the day, and that's only because I'm, I now just break out, I look at any insect pest, but take sulfur and a, a tube sock, pour the sulfur in the tube sock, take it and then whack your ankles. And that will help generally with uh, chiggers not getting, getting on you as you are maybe out hiking a trail or something, because yes, chiggers are, are gonna be, and they're a mite, they're gonna be bad this year too. I'm just gonna chalk it up to 2021 is gonna be the year of the insect. <laughs> yes, I agree. No, we're agree. not, not gonna have that crazy cicada here. Do not worry. Okay, good. Good to know. All right, I did put those links on the city bugs, which I love that that one, uh, and then the fire ant link that you had put on your slide. So ever shared that with everyone. So anyone, if you've got a question, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Yeah, and for the Donna on the 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 dead tree and the roaches. Roaches like organic matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Okay, and while you're thinking- Compost piles and mulch piles. I keep saying if they're outdoors, great. I'm with all of y'all, like I said last week, anything that crosses the threshold and comes indoors, game on. Yes, I agree, I agree. All right, while you're thinking of any other questions, uh, I did put a link there for a survey and guys, the, the only way we can provide these programs that you need, the information you need is by letting us know. So I put a few questions on some of the information that Janet put on there. There's a couple of uh, areas where you can put, ask questions. I know some of you on your registration, uh, you were asking a couple of questions on there, but put any information you want to, any suggestion, think about it. I'll send the survey later on again. So. Don't feel you have to go do it right now, but I sure would appreciate it because uh, I'll be sending it again. But this is the only way we get these programs that you need is by you letting us know, did we do a good job? Do we need different information? Uh, that type of stuff. So, all right. Any if there's you guys want to work in the future, just let us know. Absolutely. And, and hopefully, well, we're headed into opening up and be able to have hybrid programs and in-person and be able to have more hands-on um, programs too. So those will be fun. Okay, great presentation. Wonderful, I agree, I agree, Donna. Well, we've, we've got five minutes. Um, I can let y'all go and get, get back to your day. Yes. And we can let y'all go. So again, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. And Janet, as always, thank you so much for, for your program, for your information that you provided to us today. You're welcome. Y'all take care. Have a great weekend. Stay dry. You too. And uh, may I ask one real quick, fast question, Janet? I was, I was going to try not to interrupt. Uh, you were talking about a gets in the house game on. Um, I noticed some super tiny little white dots on some of my pots in the house and next thing I know they're on everything including my African violets everything and I tried to take pictures I think they're aphids or super it, super tiny white dots they could be white flies or they could be mealy bugs if generally if you go to like a, a garden shop and I know you can order them online they make a yellow um a sticky card. Okay. 
I'm looking, Crystal. I'm, I'm trying to do. No, that's okay. Yeah, I tried to take pictures to upload to INAT, but it's all blurry. I, I cannot get a decent photo of it. If there were flags, like that good luck. <laughs> yeah. Okay. At least with a cell phone, you know. If I just did a, a quick search, if you just type mm -hmm. in white fly sticky traps, <laughs> there's three sellers out there that you can buy from. Amazon. Thank being you. Because I'm especially worried about my violets. I the rest of them yeah. I can throw outside, rinse off. I don't care. But the violets, I'm so worried about. Yeah, I don't blame you, and I would. I would get those. Get that, and then um, if you want, uh, drop me a note. Or if you just do AgriLife and Whitefly, I think our I think our publication is out there. Okay. Or I can always just. Go ahead and upload the snippet of video I've got to my YouTube and then send you the link. Okay. That yeah. Works. Thank you so much, Janet. You're quite welcome. All right. Any more questions? We got two minutes. There's any other questions you've got? And if not, feel free to think about something later. Email me, email Janet. Uh, one of the things I like to tape, tell people re, uh, here recently is if you're Googling something, put AgriLife, the word AgriLife first, and then the next few words, and guaranteed you're going to get one of our websites that'll have information. All right. Well. I don't see I don't see any more. So Janet, again, thank you so much. Everyone, thank you so much. And have a great rest of the day and a great weekend.